I'll invite our speakers uh, and panel to uh, be seated. Uh, they've done a nice job of laying the groundwork in these opening uh, 30 to 40 minutes. And the reason Jill and I have been a little firm with them is to allow ample opportunity for Professor you Boyce now to pose talent. your questions, which I'm sure there are many. You can see it's a broad range of, of uh, direction we could go in the time we have allocated for the rest of the meeting. Everything from, well, what does this mean to me on the farm? Uh, how do we get here? More comments on uh, the regulatory issue of 209 and 213. And, and also, uh, you could spend the rest of the time, Peter, on, well, what's going to happen now? Because clearly more changes are coming. More people, more... Uh, uh, bodies are meeting on this specific issue and they their discussions and their decisions may have impact on how we uh, are able to use or not able to use antimicrobials in the future so with that we're going to open the floor to uh, questions and um, I'll spend the rest of the time making sure that uh, you get your questions answered uh, of the many issues that have been laid out so the floor is open and yours Can I buy a pallet of Thailand and and then use it over the course of a year? I mean, can you just buy it ahead of time so I don't have to keep buying three bags at a time or whatever I use? You mean before the regs hit? <laughs> <laughs> you already did that. You don't have any Furox, though, right? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that's a little close. Um, you're going to need to have a VFD for usage, and so uh, the FDA understands if, if you're making feed at your location, you're going to need to have a supply there. So one, one interesting thing, I, I, we actually made a little progress on the efficiency of the VFD process um, in, in the past, or currently actually, uh, with Palmatil and new floor feed medications. We had to give an estimate of how much feed was going to be made so what the consumption of those pigs was going to be. Obviously, sick pigs sometimes don't eat a lot of feed, so it can vary considerably uh, on groups of pigs how much they're going to eat. We don't need to do that any longer. We need to follow the labels of the bags. That's something that didn't change before or with over-the-counter. Obviously, you can only feed that product according to the label. And I think that's why we've been very safe uh, as, a, as an industry, pigs, cattle, others is because you can only feed it per label anyway. I can't as a veterinarian, different than injectable products, I can't change how you use the product. It's not legal for feed medication. So um, that's a benefit, I think. So uh, yeah, you'll be able to buy um, you know, uh, a larger amount or a large amount, normal, probably to what you're doing today. But you need to have a VFD and you need to, if you get inspected by the FDA, as long as you have your documentation in order, not a problem. Yeah, question, Peter, for you. You showed uh, some modeling of what the expectations are potentially of antimicrobial resistance as a cause of mortality in humans in 2050. Can you give us an idea where those estimates are today? Um, I can't internationally, Tom, but the, um, the CDC's data uh, is 23,000 deaths annually in the U.S. that are attributed to antimicrobial resistant infections and, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of infections. So that's at a, at a U.S. level. I don't have a, a global figure in my, in my head, and, and it would be a very rough one anyway, you know, because there's a, a substantial underreporting and lots of guesstimates involved in those those numbers. Next question. While you're waiting, uh, Peter, you talked about uh, measuring, right? You, you talked about uh, we need to better, we need to measure better. Can you suggest for the audience what that may be? Yeah, um, that's specifically what I've been working on with the uh, National Pork Board, uh, actually, is just looking at potential models for that. So there's all these pressures lined up for doing it. The first and most immediate one is regulatory, that, that, that um, 
the national action plans calling for better data coming from the uh, animal health uh, industry about the sales of their products, and they're wanting data at a species level. The reality is there's no way they can produce that because so many products are actually sold for use in multiple species and they don't have data on how things are used. So um, where that goes in terms of the direction for getting more specific sales data, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a bit of a bind. The second um, one is that the FDA is wanting to be able to measure the impact of the regulations. They're actually putting uh, uh, Pressure is not the right word. They're encouraging uh, the USDA to develop systems to do that. Currently, there's no funding for it. So currently, that is an unfunded mandate. The FDA wants data uh, from the USDA to be measured on on-farm use. There's no money available for that to happen. So it's probably not going to happen in, in the short term unless all of a sudden uh, um, there is some money appearing out of the sky to do that. The third uh, option is actually through uh, industry uh, collaboration, and there's been a number of meetings now that have involved uh, uh, the pork board, uh, the um, poultry, uh, turkey and egg layers people, the beef people, the dairy people, uh, and they've been discussing the issue that there is a lot of proprietary data that is held in uh, um, particularly in companies that are in production side, uh, there's the possibility and, and the uh, poultry industry is much further down the track. They already have a survey uh, instrument. They're going to be collecting data this year from uh, people sharing data, confidential, confidentiality initially within the, the industry for benchmarking purposes to look to actually find out how things are being used and looking at making that data anonymous and sharing it with the USDA NAMs with respect to getting baseline data and trends in the industry. So we're looking, I'm specifically looking at that option uh, and other options in the pig industry. Uh, Mike Apley at Kansas State is doing it in the beef industry. So there's a lot going on really where the industries are sort of moving and say, okay, um, if we don't contribute or don't take control perhaps of this process, there's going to be people making us doing it and there's being efforts to introduce legislation to mandate uh, collection of on-farm data. So there's, it's a very complex answer, Gordon, because it, it, there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of initiatives going on at the moment. But the point of the pork, pork board and all the industries at the moment is to say, okay, we need to try and you know, get on the bus rather than get run over by the bus. Thank you. Comments? Question? Peter, I was wondering if uh, what you know about experiences from other countries as far as increased antibiotic regulation and do we think in the U.S. here we'll be able to, uh, Just like would we expect a different outcome here or uh, are some of those considerations coming into into play here as we're deciding how to move forward in the U.S.? Yeah. That's a good question, Stephen. And, and sure, there is a, quite a bit of, of experience now from these, what, you know, the Swedes did it first in 1986 before the Danes did it in 2000 and subsequently other EU countries. Nearly all cases, um, there was initially increased antibiotic use of the first year or two because they were dealing with uh, particularly enteric disease in, in wean pigs. So that was the Swedish and the Danish and the Dutch uh, experiences. So that the, it's not like removal of the growth promotants has, uh, is a zero effect issue on animal health. And it's affected animal health in all those countries and they've adapted to it one way or the other. The other side that you hear about, and which is equally true, is that those industries are still there, they're still competitive, um, they're still in business. There's been, you know, probably the biggest thing in Denmark, they've got the best data, there was uh, exiting a lot of particularly smaller producers uh, and increased consolidation, and again, largely probably due to the increased veterinary oversight and how that cost is managed and lack of, of the ability to buy um, um, products readily available. So there's impact on the, on the loss. But the industries stay there. Uh, they haven't gone away. Uh, the other part, again, and all these questions are complex, uh, unfortunately, 
is the, the impact on antibiotic resistance. So the impact of antibiotic resistant bacteria. The most troubling thing I see in Europe is the initiatives to reduce, reduction, reduce use in the animal side get justified by the impact on human health, but then they stop really measuring it because it's hard and the objective becomes reducing use becomes an end in itself without paying any attention either to the animal health side or to the human resistance side. But certainly I would make the statement that no one has been able to show a demonstrable a demonstrable improvement in antibiotic resistance with one exception which is macrolide resistance so uh, in Campylobacter coli in pigs which may or may not have any health public health importance but certainly that's one where they've seen resistance going down the Danish data on salmonella which drove the uh, whole argument is actually gone the other way uh, the resistance is now higher than it was then so there's no um, there's no flicking the switch and saying everything gets better. I think that's an important point. So essentially for 15 years Denmark has, has had those changes in place. They have not seen a reduction in resistance on the human side. Questions? My question isn't from a commercial standpoint, but um, I work at a local little feed mill, and we have a lot of 4-H and FFA kids. And all of their show pigs that they're raising and all of our commercial feeds that we're purchasing for the show pig industry are all coming with antibiotics in them. What advice do you have for us small little producers for our FFA and 4-Hers? Yeah, there, there's some glaring uh, holes in the process still today. That's one, that's one of them is, uh, you know, um, suppliers that had pre-made bags of feed that included antibiotic uh, is going to be real troublesome to deal with. And we've pushed the FDA on that, and they don't have an answer for us today. Um, I think... You know, like we've done, uh, the veterinary industry has been in, involved in doing PQA with 4-Hers and such. I think we need to probably use that strategy to have that contact and try to be ahead of the curve as much as we can. But uh, there's no good answer for that. There's also species of uh, livestock that don't have really any proved products for them. And so uh, that's an issue we still need some clarification from the FDA. Uh, as to how we're going to deal with that, llamas, uh, sheep, there's not much for some of those species, goats, that sort of thing. So, um, I don't know, Laura, if you've got any comments. So I think um, probably what's going to happen is a lot of that floor stock is going to be non-medicated. Um, and because they cannot make the feed to have on hand and then bring a VFD in, correct? It cannot be made until there's a VFD right. in hand. And so I think what's going to happen is just a lot of floor stock that's unmedicated. I think there's going to need to be, um, and not, not just for show pigs, but I think there's going to be uh, uh, other, other farms that are going to probably look at other routes of dealing with treatment on those animals. Feed won't be as convenient for everybody. It won't make the most sense in every situation. So water medications, injectable medications, I think will probably, um, we'll need to make different kinds of decisions in, in a lot of cases. So companies like Kent, Neutrina, Hubbard, all those show feeds that are coming with antibiotics in them, they're going to have to change them at the company level then? Yeah, it, it's it's going to be it's going to be really hard um, on the show pig level to be able to um, just go and get medicated feed, and so it will likely be if they if they do want to have medicated feed, it's probably going to incur more of a cost because they're going to have to get a VFD from a veterinarian and then make a certain amount of that feed. You know, now it's cheaper for them because it's you know floor stock, like you said, it's already medicated, um, and so now their cost is going to be into making that that pellet of feed. It's a great question. There's, a, there's some details here that aren't worked out. As, it, as you ask that, it becomes apparent, right? So a year from now, right, a year from now, we'll know 
more than we know today. We're not done dealing with the FDA. I mean, we need to continue to dialogue because some of those real world issues are, aren't going to go away and we're going to discover new ones as this process is implemented. And uh, I would say that um, a, lot of, a lot of producer groups, a lot of veterinary groups have continued to try and keep those issues front and center of the FDA. We can't make those calls. They're going to have to make them, but we can continue to try and explain situations and, and do the best we can so those scenarios they're aware of, and maybe we can accommodate as much as we can. You know, they're, sorry, not to cut my boss off, but <laughs> off. probably tired now. Um, I'll take the mic away. You know, yeah, please do. He doesn't have a mic now. Go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> You know, there were a few, I just thought, you know, there are a few that were not on the medically important list. And so, you know, like Mechadox is one. The problem that you incur with that is the really long withdrawal. And so, you know, young pigs, wean pigs, you know, a, a Mechadox might still be an option for, for a floor stock. But it, it definitely limits you um, on, your, on your choices for sure. Go ahead, Tim. Tim, you had a question. Uh, just a clarification, Dr. Ruin, and maybe on Bruner's talk. Um, so she has four nurseries, she has six finishers on those pictures. So one question would be, how does she have to have visited each one of those sites, or is just seeing a nursery okay? And the second part of that question was, she said she had ileitis in the finisher. I also know she has salmonella and mycoplasma. So she needs three different water meds. Uh, and so can they have those on hand? You got to do some more training, Tim. That's just a lot of problems. <laughs> it was a client I took over from him. I think you get the, yeah, I think you get the yeah. point, Paul. Right? The hard ones get given to Laura from yeah. Tim. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so question, uh, yeah, how do, we, how do we deal with how many VFDs and how do we, how do we handle those issues? I um, mean, I, I think, I guess step back from that. One is I think we are going to, which we need to be doing anyway, but we're going to reevaluate health plans, right? We're going to reevaluate pig flows. And uh, so that will be part of this too. And that can be a good thing. We'll get, we'll get better in some ways because of being forced to do this. Um, the regulation as a... Uh, as, as, as it is today, is that prescription and veterinary client-patient relationship is defined at the state level in most cases. But it, and if a state practice act doesn't define that, then it defers to the federal. And there's a codified VCPR description in, at the federal level. So it'll be a little different by state. Okay, and so if I, uh, I live in Minnesota, I, I am licensed in Minnesota and Iowa, okay, if I have clients in Minnesota and Iowa and I have a, a relationship that meets those standards, which, uh, uh, you know, typically is you, you got to have, you got to have a defined relationship where you've been involved with that farm in consulting and being at the farm at some point. Doesn't mean I have to have been there this week or last week or three months ago. It's going to be different by state, and most of them won't even get into that level of detail as to how often you need to be there. But it's got to be something that's going to stand up and say, you know, yeah, you got a legitimate relationship. So I don't think that'll be a, a lot different for most cases, but it's going to require a little more intent relationship for some, no question. Um, so that's defined at the state level. Uh, another change, uh, we both kind of, Laura and I mentioned a few things about the new VFD rule that are different. And one, one I said is that you don't have to put down how many pounds of feed is going to get used. Um, another one is that it lasts for six months. So that probably implies you probably got to have some contact there, maybe a couple times a year at least, right, to be a legitimate situation. Um, and the, a third thing is that we are going to be able to, as long as we have that knowledge, we don't necessarily need to be at every site that routinely. We need to have knowledge of that flow of pigs. So sow farm flows, I think, as, uh, would, would be where I'd focus on as those far, pigs move downstream to that nursery and those finisher sites. We need to have knowledge of that. I don't know that we need to have been at every site every six months. That does not appear to be the case. There's no level of detail that says that's the case. 
But you've got to have legitimate knowledge. If we're going to consult and help make good decisions, we've got to have good information flow back and forth with client and vet. So I don't know if that satisfies what you're getting at. Yeah, the only other part was, can you have three different kinds of water bed prescriptions on site in case they start coughing or at that uh, I think kind of like the feed product, if you have um, a history of certain diseases that require those and you have written prescriptions for those uses uh, in that flow, then yes. And I, Questions? I think too, um, diagnostics are really powerful. Um, and so I don't know how much U.S. producers do much diagnostics, but if you can, you know, post a pig, maybe send in tissues from a nursery and, and, and show that you're actively trying to make the best medication decisions based on the information that you have. I think that's really powerful. And, um, and so I encourage you guys, if you don't do very much, that um, that's, that's definitely something that will be helpful going forward. Yeah, I, I just had a, had a, a comment, because I think this question of keeping good records, both particularly probably for the veterinarians, but also for the producers, could have really uh, a lot of impact long term. Um, our VCPR requirements are very vague, and I think that's a, actually a very good thing in terms of needing sufficient knowledge of the health of the animals. Um, some of the European countries are much more restrictive. The veterinarian actually has to have been uh, on the site uh, within two weeks, as the case in Germany, I think three weeks in Belgium. There, there are periods of weeks which, in our geography would be really, really problematic. I think if we see situations where things go wrong, um, the FDA investigates, people don't have good uh, record keeping and, we, and, and it seems as, you know, things are shoddy, that's likely to draw a lot more scrutiny of the VCPR and the way it is, is regulated. So I think, you know, think long term in terms of what can go wrong and I think it will be in everyone's interest to make sure people are doing a good job acknowledging what a pain in the butt it is, uh, but it, it is probably going to be really important. Questions from the audience? Paul, you showed a slide. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, did I miss somebody in the back? Thank you. She didn't want that one. Um, <laughs> well, um, I can't answer with detail to that, but I do know that over the next, uh, this, this 12 months, the FDA hopes to be involved with a lot of training sessions and education sessions. So I'm, I'm hopeful that'll be forthcoming, Chris. We'll, we'll learn about that. Um, but you know, they've already had the authority to come on your sites. Um, you know, that's their job, and so uh, they haven't exercised it very often. But first, they're going to try and educate and and take that route. Then they're going to look at. Um, they've they've stated that they're going to look at. Um, you know where where the VFDs are being written written to and and uh, and so I'm guessing that high high users probably be more likely to get um, a visit or a contact phone call or ask for maybe some data, but um, I I don't think we really know where that's going to go yet. Do you think that they if they were going to start a focus, it would be more at the feed mill level, making sure that paperwork is correct and. Yeah, I'm not sure. Probably, I guess probably. I just make, yeah. um, at the moment, uh, it's. I mean, it's largely been driven by residue events up till now. So if things have gone wrong, there are residues. That's when they'll. We don't have tend those to, though. Yeah, and now so. we, as long as we we stay that way, and we should be better off into in into the future. Right. Um, but I think the uh, one thing is just resourcing. Uh, and at the moment, you know, there's not a lot of. Uh, extra funding coming through for enforcement related activities has gone up a little bit in the last few years. So I think, as Paul says, the emphasis is going to be more on the education side than it is on the um, uh, actual random testing type of thing. Yeah, I think exactly. Our track record's been so good on residues, but residue isn't what they're after here. 
it's antibiotic resistance, which we haven't connected those dots yet to know what's creating that or what situations more likely create that. Um, so I, I, don't know that, I don't know that we know how that's going to be handled yet. Uh, but other species are going it, to, it's way more new to the cattle guys than it is to us and pigs. We have some experience. We have a lot of contact already with, in most cases with producers and veterinarians. But there isn't that in some of the other species. So I think the struggles and perhaps some of the um, inspections might be more likely to be in those areas because we've had such a great track record. Questions? Just a comment. If production use is what they've really targeted the most, you know, to just not have things in the feed for rated gain and such, it would seem that the feed mill would be the first place that they would make sure that that's not reoccurring if that's what they're after. It's just the resistance and production use is what's being phased out. It just seems like that's where they would do the check. Yeah, comment was. Uh, you know, feed mill might make sense if you're going to, understanding that production use is going away, they might want to verify that's actually happening, that, that as the labels change, people are following the label. Paul, you showed a slide, uh, and you may wish to elaborate, or all the panel members, on important versus <coughs> critically important. Could you elaborate on that further? I'm going to hand that to Peter. Yeah, um, on this, how those decisions are made. There's various, uh, yeah, there, there's a number of issues they look at. Uh, if, if a product's important to humans, uh, for instance, one is, is there a, is there a, are there many products available to treat that indication or that problem in humans? If there's not many, that one's going to be a critical drug. They're not going to want um, that they're going to want a lot of oversight on the use of that in food animals if there's only one drug, for instance, that can treat a certain disease in people. That would be one. I'll let Peter jump in. Yeah, the, the, they had a list of about five or six criteria that they used to do this. Um, the one at the top of the list was actually whether the drug is used to treat foodborne infections, like salmonella, campylobacter, the things that could be foodborne. That was at the top. So if there were drugs that were considered highly important in human medicine, uh, uh, that was one. Or as Paul mentioned, if there was a, a, a drug that could only be used for one particular, there was only one drug for a particular condition in human medicine, if they were either of those criteria, they were likely to be critically, imp uh, critically important. And they also talked about things about the way the, re the resistance was you know, transmitted in the bacteria. They had a, n a bunch of geeky microbiology things, but the key things was, you know, is this drug only, uh, you know, the only one we've got a last ditch sort of things for these particular uh, infections. One thing I will point out is that the World Health Organization did the same exercise. Uh, and I used different criteria and they've got the lists and the two lists aren't the same. Um, and one of, the, one of the drugs that was considered not important uh, in the FDA list is actually highly important in the WHO list. Um, and so one of the things uh, we need to be aware of is that those lists might change. And if they do change, it probably won't be in our, in our favor. Peter, you mentioned, uh, and could you elaborate, you said in Denmark and Sweden it, it led to uh, more consolidation, uh, is that bigger farms, less small farms, or could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, Tim. The, uh, uh, in Denmark, uh, in Sweden, I, I can't comment because you know they, they've got a very small industry anyway. It's different, but but Denmark is a you know is a big pig producer. Um, I have you know data from a friend there that looked at their the demographics over their industry works works for the uh, Danish meat industry uh, over the period, and what they lost was a, you know a large number of the of the smallest producers, you know. And that's been happening everywhere for a long time, but it appeared to accelerate in that period after the uh, removal of the growth promoters. So at, at that stage, it, it appeared there over those 10 years or so, they consolidated more rapidly than the US industry was in that particular period. So um, uh, in Sweden, again, it's, it's more of a sort of a cottage industry thing, so I shouldn't say that, but um, I'm not sure. Tom, you had a question? 
Yeah, uh, cost of production. I know, I know it's one uh, that we're not supposed to be talking about too much, but it seems to me that it kind of relates to what Tim was asking about consolidation. <coughs> so, is there any projections done by, by any group in regards to with implementation of these regulations, what will happen to cost average cost of production? Cost of products, cost of services, provided to, to get the products to the pigs? Not, not, I really haven't seen anything. FDA had a few, couple numbers on cost of implementing the new, pro, the new process, the new VFD. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, Tom, what that was. Um, you could go online and look up the new VFD rule and it's right in there their estimates. They actually said that we would be more efficient after we implement this and cost will go down. So only the government can add regulation and say cost will go down. <laughs> I, I mean, I think the hope is too with more veterinary oversight maybe you're making better medication decisions and therefore need to use less antibiotics and so um, there's certainly going to be a cost incurred with issuing VFDs and having veterinarians come out. Um, but hopefully at the end of the day, you um, are making better medication decisions and hopefully bring your cost of production down. If Tim comes out. I don't know about me as much, but if <laughs> Tim comes out. Peter, or anyone, uh, in regards to the European experience, how have they measured and what has the metric what are they saying? Um, again, I mentioned before, some of the, I mean, all countries, they've got resistance monitoring programs in place. So they're measuring usually Salmonella, Campylobacter, a couple of other bugs, uh, and looking at resistance in them. Um, they, as I mentioned before, apart from one exception, haven't been able to measure a whole lot of change. What they are focusing on is use, uh, particularly we have the example, uh, everyone's talked about Denmark for 15 years. Uh, the example that is going to get held up more in front of us now is Holland, uh, because Holland has reduced their antibiotic use in food animals by 50% over about three or four years. Uh, and they did that for because they had pressures from two reasons. One, they were a relatively high user of drugs in food animals compared to the other EU, country, EU countries and they had a big political issue with the uh, Mercer and their pig industry. The government mandated that the food animal industries were responsible for reducing their antibiotic use by 50 per cent. And they did it uh, and from what we're hearing and it's hard to you know, really get your hands around the, the information is that it hasn't been with a, a great uh, loss in terms of animal health and productivity. So that's the official line coming out. It probably doesn't mean that there haven't been individual producer or even individual systems that have had uh, great financial difficulty or possibly exited the industry because of these, these changes. But at a collective level, they're still, um, they're still the, the impact, they're saying the impact hasn't been great on cost of that 50% reduction. But their use is still higher than the use in Denmark now. Denmark is the place that is, is very low. And to cl clarify, the 50% reduction is based on what metrics? That's sales yeah, to the that industry? Was, uh, yep, they, they, they've got a, um, a measure where they convert, you know, one of the things, most of the stuff we see, particularly in the US, everything's in, in tons. It's in weight, and that's a really bad measure because different drugs have got different potency. What most of the European countries doing now is they're dividing basically by the potency of the dose and they get a measure that's in animal doses. So that's what they're measuring it on. It's in animal doses per so many 10,000 pigs or whatever we, we want to do it. So yeah, they've, they've got a reasonably... The, uh, the Danish guy that spoke at Iowa State meeting this fall, uh, he, they had since 2010 a milligrams of drug per kilogram of pork produced. So it's on an individual pig basis, times how many pigs mm -hmm. you have. So they are keeping that since 2010. And the other thing that's interesting is Holland and Denmark have been big changers in their flow. And so almost 50% of Danish pigs now go out of the country. And so they've had to shut down packing plants uh, because they don't have finishing pigs. Pigs are being fed in Germany and Poland and stuff like that. A lot of Dutch pigs are 
traveling to Spain and, and similar places. So, yeah, they got rid of their antibiotics, but they shifted them to Spain and Poland. Or, or, and I'm sure the flow helps them some as well, you know, by doing multi-site versus fair and finish, which many of those were 10 years ago. So it yeah. changes. It's like, change the it's like all four sorts of accounting. You know, there's ways of doing stuff. And, you know, they'll claim that they've adjusted for the, for the wean pig loss, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's not that transparent. One back there. Question in the back. Did you hear the question? What I let, could I repeat? What will be the consequences for a feed mill out of compliance? Or a producer. They found a, or a veterinarian for that matter. Well, uh, I'm not, I don't want to speak for the FDA, so I don't know, Diane, exactly how to answer that. But, you know, there's issues already today where people get out of compliance, so I'm, I'm sure that process won't change a lot. I, I can't think it would, but I don't know how to answer that. We need someone from the FDA probably to answer that. Question? Um, Dr. Roon, just wondering, how's this going to change your practice? Are you going to have to have extra manpower to handle this, or what are you going to do with that? Yeah, question is, how is this going to change vet practices? How, from a staffing or just functioning standpoint, how are we going to deal with this? Laura touched on that a little bit. We already, you know, have some familiarity with, with doing VFDs for a couple of products. Um, so um, we're still, I think you're going to see veterinary practices and, and production systems probably go a few different directions on that. Um, uh, Global Vet Link is a current program or a company that has available a feed link program you can do online automatically. It'll send you a reminder that, hey, VFD is about to expire. What do you want to do? Uh, it's a very convenient location. You can log on from your phone and, and laptop, like Laura mentioned. Um, so I think we'll likely see one or two more enter that. I think I'm hearing rumors of that. I think we're going to see some data management systems that are going to develop a, a kind of an add-on program to their grow finish side uh, of records. Uh, I think you're going to see some uh, develop their own internal. The FDA doesn't care what system you use as long as it's written. It has to be written. And so I think you might see even spreadsheets get used and then uh, emailed out completed VFDs from those. Um, in terms of time, I guess we won't know exactly till we get there, but uh, I know Laura spoke at Lehman in the fall and, and we've kind of done some modeling ourselves and you know, we're probably going to be seven to I think you, you said seven to ten minutes maybe for, for, per VFD, and I think that might be pretty close. So it's going to help us if we can write it to flows, you know, uh, minimize maybe how many we got to do. But the tough ones to deal with will be the emergency ones. I'm at your farm, and someone needs a VFD because feed's got to get made today for pigs. How are we going to deal with that? Um, we're going to obviously, I think, to need to use, utilize some lay staff. They are going to allow us you know, to have a written, uh, an, auth uh, an authorized uh, written signature, electronic signature, uh, in some cases, as uh, long as the system passes their muster. So uh, I think as long as we've communicated with the client and we're familiar, have the VCPR in place, we'll be able to use some, some lay staff, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to increase cost a little bit. Yep, we're going to have to work through that process because uh, Unfortunately, as Peter mentioned, in Europe, these veterinarians get almost like government officials. They're out there as regulatory people, and they're not out there consulting and trying to make farms, you know, trying to help the farm make better decisions. And so we sure don't want to end up there. Question here? Maybe let Laura comment on that, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, just I, I think about our, our clients and our practice and um, – there's, I think there's going to be a lot of paperwork and a lot of, you know, making sure that we keep track and, you know, the customer service and, like, making sure that we have the right diet and the right medication to the right feed mill. And so I think from the office standpoint, I think it's going to require, um, you know, more man hours there because um, we're going we're gonna to need that help. If, if I need to prove veterinary oversight, I can't be in the office signing VFDs all day. And so we're going to probably have to um, put a lot more man hours um, in the office because 
you think about the number of diets that you have just in your nursery phase um, and the number of sites and the number of feed mills that get used, it, when you start really thinking about it, and I encourage all of you to start thinking about it now. I mean, ideally, we'd, we'd start in June and just work out all the bugs before January, but I would start thinking about what that's going to look like for you and, and your business and then start having those conversations with your veterinarian now um, so that when January comes around, it's a little bit smoother transition. With one, <clears throat> excuse me, with one million pigs coming in from Canada, what are the implications um, for the veterinary feed directive? I mean, I would assume that it's, um, you know, wouldn't be any, any different if they're fed here um, in the U.S., there would have to be a veterinarian that has knowledge of those pigs here. Um, if, if, if I have a client that's in Minnesota but raises some pigs in Iowa, I have to be licensed in that state. So you have to be licensed in the state in which the pigs are fed um, in order to issue that VFD. So I think as long as you have that VCPR with those pigs once they come in, it won't be any different. Dale. Hey Gordon, I'm, I'm uh, wondering if there's a weak link here. We talked about the producer side and the veterinary side. Is anyone educating the feed mills? I live in an area where there are oh, probably half a dozen mills within 15 miles of me. And in my random little sampling of their knowledge, they're not very familiar with the BFD requirement. So I'm just wondering, is anybody talking to the mills and educating them? I have a feeling some are going to drop out as far as uh, livestock processing feeds uh, because in my area they, they do cattle and hogs a very limited number of hogs, horses of course, and, and stuff. So who's talking to the feed mill? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Who's, who's talking to the feed mills and who's educating the feed mills? And I, um, I'm sure Paul or Peter can speak more to that, but I would say um, as a producer that's part of your thinking when you start planning on what's going to happen January, um, your feed mill is one of the one of the calls that you would make as long as well as your veterinarian, so that you can get them start thinking about it. Because you're right, it, it will affect them um, greatly. I'm right here. Um, I in the last year I've spoken to a couple of groups, uh, feed mill um, manufacturers, uh, feed. I know that uh, there's been some dialogue from, is it AFIA, uh, with the FDA, and they've obviously on their uh, annual meeting dealing, dealing with uh, antibiotic usage and such, it's gotten attention there. So hopefully there's people getting in the loop on that. Um, but I, I know that uh, that's one group, obviously, has got to be at the table and the FDA in, in this education process this year sure, certainly has the intent to, to also, you know, connect, connect with, uh, with that part of the industry. So, um, you know, I think any of us uh, veterinarians, and, and, you know, that have been involved should be happy to visit, you know, too, if that's helpful for you. But I, I would, uh, I, I got to believe you're going to see more coming out. Yeah, and feel free to take the initiative and get a hold of the FDA and get some of the information. A lot of it's on the website, so it's available there. And uh, I think we're all going to have to probably take some initiative. Yeah, I just wanted to make the comment that your yeah, AFEIA, the Feed Industry Association, has put a fair bit of effort, at least in a, putting out materials, trying to educate the, the feed mills because that's their that's their membership. Um, I think again, as always, you know, smaller mills and multi-species mills, they're probably going to be the ones that are going to be most difficult to get to. But they've had the whole Food Safety Modernisation Act to deal with in itself, so there's been a lot going on in the feed mill side uh, that. Um, Messages are being sent. I was going to question how they're being received. Okay. Yeah, it's getting better. I mean, when we first had the VFDs, we had a lot of feed mills didn't have email, you know, and so we need we need kind of the basics of communication established so that we can, you know, communicate efficiently and timely so that we get the right pig, the right meds at the right time. And so I think we got to keep that first and foremost. What can we do to improve the communication? Um, so. 
Oh, I, I just wanted to comment that at our feed mill that I work for, we started getting notification in November from our state inspector mm. um, that this was coming down and what was going to be expected of us. And also from our reps coming from the places where we get our bagged feed from, that they're also giving us all the information Good. too. Good. So there are resource people out there. Good. And so what are the initial thoughts on how much it's going to change your we're day just, to day? We're just going to have to do, um, or I'm going to have to do a lot more paperwork also, and we have to keep the scripts for two years in mm -hmm. the files. And again, if they're um, scripts that are repeated, they have to be every six months that the vets have to be out there. And some of our areas, it's we're losing our large animal vets. Mm -hmm. So we have that concern. And then the large animal vets that we have are they're dairy people. So having vets that are knowledgeable of pigs is another one of our little hoops that we have to manage. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? Sure. Steve? This is just kind of a question. Um, how do you think it's going to change some of the recommendations that we make as far as controlling diseases such as PERS or mycoplasma in the future? If those are really diseases that cause us, that, that we use a lot of antibiotics in, is that changing the way we think about eliminating, eradicating, vaccinating, autogenous, whatever? What are kind of some of the thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think there's huge opportunity. When you look at what costs the industry the most money, um, PERS and mycoplasma are at least at, at the top of my list, and so, um, managing those diseases, eradicating those diseases. Um, we've shown in multiple clients that really decrease um, the amount of antibiotics that are used. And so I think that's going to be a huge part of this. What To what extent uh, producers get help with that, I, I, I don't know. But um, that's something, you know, that we could talk to, um, Talk to the higher ups and, and and say, is there is there any way that we can get funding to maybe help producers eradicate these diseases so that we use less antibiotics? Put your money where your mouth is a little bit. I have one. I guess if, if there's any, I don't know if there's any packers in in the room. You know, what kind of pressure are you guys getting as far as reporting antibiotic use? per pound sold, or are you getting, I don't know if there is any packers in the audience? Corey. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of metrics are they, are they looking for on an individual client or as a, as a whole? Uh, you know, what is the standard measurement, uh, like uh, Peter said, uh, you know, whether it's a daily dose uh, uh, measurements like they've done here, or else uh, a milligram per kilogram, milligram per pound. Both of those are, are one to being thrown out there, but really it's uh, just are you measuring and how quick can you get a measurement to us? As a follow oh, sorry. I was just going to make one follow up to Steve and Laura. Is I, I spoke at a uh, PERS meeting in December and another one at an area regional and really the most antibiotics go into pigs after a PERS break. You know, they want to give Braxton, they want to give exceed, they want to put Pulmacil in the feed, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I really think the industry needs to relook at, uh, we can eradicate PERS, it's been trouble keeping it from re-breaking, but I think we have the knowledge to maybe go forward at a faster pace and maybe model it after pseudorabies because that would do more for reducing antibiotic use than anything else we could think about here. So Tim's advocating uh, disease elimination, eradication. What else can we learn from the European experience on what have they done for production practices that uh, would, uh, that we may forecast, that may, uh, may occur because of all this? That, that's a really good um, 
question, uh, Gordon, that, that we're actually wanting to try and get some information on this year. Like the, du the Dutch have reduced 50% in two or three years. So what did they do? Is that ex increased wean age? That, is that, that what, is, what did they do? But, and actually, where and how they've done that is not particularly transparent. And, and more importantly, what things haven't they been able to reduce? You know, I was at a meeting in last year and we had a uh, pig consultant from Denmark talk, and he was, again, it comes back to the wean pig issue, when he was saying every pig in our practice is starting with medicated feed because we haven't found a way of not doing that yet. And, uh, and my sense is the same thing is happening in the other European countries, but no one's really putting their hand up and saying that that is a necessary and justifiable, and it's something that, regardless of our system, we haven't been able to get. And, and again, on the scale of pork production, you're medicating low body weight pigs, the amount of use isn't there, but you know, what preventive practices are really important to animal health that do we have to fight for? And part of the problem is that, that um, it hasn't come out of um, Europe yet just exactly where they've hit the roadblocks. So mm -hmm. That's something we're actually trying to get information on this year. So maybe if members of our audience may not be elaborating further on the Dutch or the Danish experience with their red card system and their, their, their card. Maybe you want to just very briefly yeah. review that. Yeah. Um, so what happens in, uh, in, in Denmark and in Holland now uh, they collect information on use uh, at a farm level and also at a veterinary level. And they basically draw a graph of, of and they put a line in it and saying, you know, everybody who, who's above this level uh, gets a visit or in some cases a fine, some cases with veterinarians public shaming. It's all, in Denmark it's all, it's all public. So if you're the veterinarian who is a high using veterinarian, your name gets uh, posted and you get... Uh, call it public shaming if you like, but you, it's, it's not uh, discreet. So what they're doing is have putting penalties in place for people who are high users. Problem with that is that there's no context involved. You know, and it comes back to you, are you a high user for, you may be a high user for reasons that are highly justifiable. Tim's example, if you've got farms that have had, may have had through no apparent fault of their own, a series of PERS outbreaks that have involved a series of, of pigs that needed medication, they're a high user. Um, why is it that that farm is, uh, is subject to a penalty if they may be using things in a veterinarily justifiable manner? So it's this thing that you've just got a line in the sand, high is bad, low is good, um, that is a, is, a, is a real difficult thing that's not managed. Tim. And you have nine months to get it back under that level. And so if you don't do it in nine months, uh, based on that milligram per kilogram, then you get red carding. And then you have no options on some. You get government people coming. You have to have a vet visit, like I think almost every other week. Uh, it might be every two week vet visit. They have the right to tell you you got to throw Bruder out and get ruined, or throw ruin out and get ruder, or you, they can change the vet, but you have to fix it. And if not, they can reduce the number of pigs allowed on your farm by 25%. I just want to make a couple comments on uh, the question about what else have we learned, what else could we do. I mean, um, I think communicating and, and just thinking differently about how to address problems is something we always need to be. Um, trying to work on and uh, you know we've got producers that have swapped finished barn sites with other producers so that their pigs are closer to their own sows than someone else's I mean do, there's some things we can do I think as an industry and in communities of production that that we can um, push the you know get the ball farther down the court um, by maybe rethinking about some things um, purse elimination would be great it's probably going to take us a little while to get there, but there's a lot of things we can do in, in the nearer term that we probably should focus more on. And uh, I, I think there's opportunity for that. So um, if anything comes out of this increased regulation, maybe, maybe a good thing would be more communication with the feed mills, with the producers, with the vets, 
and uh, we start finding new solutions that maybe aren't necessarily the old solutions. And uh, I, I guess I just challenge us to do that. We aren't going to change this. We have the regulation coming. We love it, right? But we're going to have to deal with it. And so uh, let's get better out of it. Let's, let's focus on that. I think, unfortunately, our time is up. Would you join me in thanking our panel of experts today? <laughs>